So I have the great honor of introducing Russ Lichterman to you. Many of you know him already. He's our multimedia manager in ed tech. And um, I've known Russ for probably more, even though he's worked here for five years, I think it took me a solid two years to convince this man to come work at Wilmington University. He was at Comcast and he came to WilmU to uh, pursue his master's degree and I was lucky enough to be his instructor for one of the courses. And I immediately saw this guy in the discussion boards, because it was probably partially or fully online, I'm not sure. And um, he was helping others in this class. And I thought, wow. And he was, so t he was making like little videos to help people learn things. And he's a student. So um, I said, you need to come by my office. I want to talk to you. And so I swear to you, I spent two years trying to convince him to come to Wilmio. Every time he would stop by, he's like, well, now I'm having another baby, or this or that. I'm like, you've got to come to Wilmio. So I fi we finally got him. <laughs> and I... Nothing, keep going. I am <laughs> so excited um, for you to have Russ as the keynote. He deserves every accolade I can even describe to you. He works super hard for all of you every day, for our students, and um, I just adore him. I don't know what else to say. That's thank it. you, Thank Russ. you, Sally. So, a oh. big round of applause for Russ. Oh, thank you. I know. <laughs> then make okay. yourself up. Yep. I only have two kids, just so you know. <laughs> she made it sound like we're one of those clown car people, and I swear we're not. Well, thank you for coming out to TLT. Uh, I hope I can take you on a little journey uh, through some of the things that we've done over the last five years. So Sally's intro, uh, while extremely flattering, uh, was also really apt for what we're going to talk about, because we're going to talk a little bit about the past, a little about today right now, and a little bit about the future. Um, so my process for doing a presentation is always come up with a clever title first and then work backwards. Um, so this is really important for what we're going to talk about because it's all about how video has changed everything and it's killed a lot of the ways that we used to think about education. So that's a picture of the Buggles uh, who did the first ever video on MTV, Video Killed the Radio Star, uh, which was sort of apt because music television took over what had traditionally been radio. On radio there was DJs and suddenly on music television there was now VJs. So for this to be the first ever music video they ever aired, Video Killed the Radio Star was very apt as well. So. Five years ago at Wilmu uh, is just about when I started. Coming up in July is, is five years for me. So uh, this is where we were. It wasn't quite as old as the picture. Um, but if you were an instructor or a student and you wanted to do anything with video, your choices were to store it somewhere free and publicly available, somewhere like YouTube or Vimeo. Uh, if you wanted to have a synchronous class session, your options were Wimba Classroom. And I'm sure some of the people who are instructors here more than five years ago have wonderful, wonderful memories of Wimba Classroom. Um, commencement was done on uh, Livestream.com and the occasional guest speaker. Livestreaming was very rare only five years ago here. Um, if you are faculty, you might be lucky enough to book some time in the College Technology Studio. You may be able to get somebody like Scott Shaw or somebody on his team to help you out if you wanted to record a little video piece. Uh, and if you were a student, you were pretty much out of luck. Uh, Maybe if you're a COT student, you get to use the studio. Uh, a very forward-thinking student might be able to put some webcam video or something on YouTube or Vimeo, but that's pretty much a picture of what video and multimedia looked like only five years ago. And here's where we are today. We've centered all of our video and multimedia around cloud-based services uh, like Blackboard Collaborate and Kaltura. Um, for asynchronous video, uh, Kaltura exists in Blackboard for all of our faculty and instructors to use. We also have a forward-facing portion of that. For synchronous interaction, we've got Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is fairly new even to us. It's a completely browser-based HTML5 experience that uses something called WebRTC, meaning no more Java. So for the people that had experience with either Wimba or Blackboard Collaborate Classic, you know that moving away from Java was very important. Uh, we're even doing some live course interaction in video-enabled classrooms. We'll talk about that project a little bit later. Um, live broadcasting, we do commencement, sports, guest speakers, live events, and more all through Kaltura, which is our online video platform because it's a purely vanilla experience, so we don't have to use a branded company like Livestream.com. So like if any of you watched last night's uh, Georgetown commencement, you saw that we have this completely live experience that's all branded Wilmington University with our logos and our colors. We use Kaltura as our backbone for that, but we get to have an experience for our end viewer that 
all they see is Wilmington University, and they're not getting any recommended videos for other universities or, or other projects, so that's always good. We don't want anyone clicking outside of our little uh, safe environment. Faculty have the ability to take advantage of all the Cal media tools from Kaltura that are built into Blackboard. Uh, they can do do-it-yourself lecture capture. They can take advantage of our brand new Learning Commons Multimedia Studio that's currently located at the Wilson Graduate Center in the new Harry Deppert Learning Commons, and we'll talk about that a little later. Students also have full advantage of Kaltura and Capture Space, just like faculty do. Uh, we're going to talk about just how many videos we already have in Kaltura. And even students now are able to book time in the HDLC Multimedia Studio, the Harry Deppert Learning Commons Multimedia Studio. That's available for students and faculty to use for a, a do-it-yourself uh, video creation experience. And I'll show you some pictures from that and tell you a little bit more about that project later. So speaking of Kaltura, right now um, we have close to 47,000. I was hoping we were going to cross the 47,000 mark before the presentation, but uh, just about 46,000 videos, 900 and some, so almost to 47,000. And almost all of those are created by, by you, by students and faculty. A very small portion of that is done with our high-end productions, multi-camera produced things like guest speakers and commencement. But almost all of those 46,000 plus videos come from students and faculty creating instructional content inside of Blackboard. We've had over 30,000 collaborate attendees since 2012. Again, trying to look at a five-year picture. Um, and that just continues to grow exponentially. Collaborate is that opportunity for you as faculty members to create a synchronous learning experience if you want to. Uh, and we've even built out some new projects uh, around that. We've had thousands of viewers from around the globe watching our live events. Uh, of course, commencement is sort of our, our featured presentation that we do live, but we, uh, Tim Day is here from the College of Technology. He has taken our Kaltura technology and run with that, and he now teaches a course with students producing live sports for Wilmu. So uh, we've been happy to provide some training and instruction and some back-end work for them, but Tim Day is using uh, students to completely produce live athletics uh, as of just this fiscal year. So that's really exciting. And if you go on Wilmu YouTube, you can see archives of our live baseball, live basketball games, live softball games, and uh, that's just continuing to get built out. And the great thing about that is that's students who are working the cameras, working the switchers, under the expert tutelage of somebody like Tim Day. <clears throat> Speaking of commencement, which is, uh, of course, the largest production that we do ourselves in the multimedia group, seven shows across the year, uh, three in the winter and four in the spring. Some of you probably saw Georgetown last night, and we still have coming up on Sunday our three Wilmington shows. So looking at winter of 2017, uh, almost 700 live viewers from 37 countries, thousands of on-demand views. Commencement's a big deal, especially because we're a university with a lot of adult learners, a lot of people around the globe, a lot of international students. So the ability for our university community to tune in and watch commencement is really important. And uh, we've been able to really bring new levels to that technology. And again, five years ago, it was a completely different picture than what we're doing now. And we're really producing broadcast quality uh, for even something uh, as important as commencement and even things like guest speakers that are booked through uh, the academic departments. Um, they get just the same high level of broadcast quality production. So why? Why video and multimedia? Why does anybody care? Why is all this important? I promise it all comes back in the end, but uh, here are some credible sources because you don't have to just take it from me. Um, online platforms just aren't using multimedia to their full potential. Uh, ASU looked into this and ASU found that students learn better when they see videos created by their instructors. Uh, faculty created videos help students get better grades, they improve retention, uh, and they make the learning experience better. And of course, the most important of all these quotes, video enhances student engagement. So these are some of the ways that we use video and multimedia right now today at Wilmu. Uh, and some of these are projects that have been going for a couple of years, and some of these are brand new projects. And I know some of the people, by the way, are in this room who are even uh, featured in some of the images that we're going to show today. Um, guest speakers, lecture capture, uh, faculty created screencasts and webcasts, and uh, moving now into student created content. Of course, we're focusing more on faculty created content, but student created content has become also very important, and we'll see some examples of that. And those are just a couple of quick screenshots. Some of them are very high-end, highly produced content, and some of it is content from instructors sitting at their desk or sitting at home uh, in their bedroom or in their workspace creating uh, content. But the important thing is that they're helping their students learn better and they're increasing engagement through video and multimedia. So how do we get people onboarded? How do we make all this happen? How do we get the traditional instructor or the non-traditional age student, because we have an awful lot of those, to buy into this technology? It has to be easy, uh, it has to be painless, and there has to be really good training. And we'll talk about how we get around all that at the end. But 
We also want to give them easy entry points. And one of the easiest ways to do that is with video announcements. So everybody, if you teach any kind of course, hopefully, but especially an online course, you got to tell your students what's going on every week. At the bare minimum, you got to jump in there and type up a little bit about what you're doing each week. So instead of just typing it up, you can record a little video announcement. Each week, you can just get on your webcam, tell students what's going on for this week. Uh, and this is uh, one of our amazing health uh, professions instructors, Angie Steele Tilton, uh, that, who has embraced this kind of technology and records an announcement once a week just to let students know what's going on. And I do practice what I preach, so here's a screenshot, and I hate showing my own examples, but I do want to say that I do this too. So every single week, there's a video announcement, and it's a really easy entry point. Just one or two minutes long to say, hey, welcome to week seven. This is what we're doing this week. This is what assignments we're going to take care of. This is the things that you need to watch, the chapters you need to read, the papers you need to write. Thanks for being a student in my class. I'm really looking forward to it. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Just adding that little bit of face-to-face -face interaction makes all the difference in the world to a student who's existing in these kind of courses. We don't want courses to be flat. We don't want courses to be read this article, write this discussion board, write this reflection paper. And five years ago, and I went through a master's program here six years ago, and uh, that was a lot of what was in an online class because there wasn't a lot of other options. So it was a lot of reading and a lot of writing because we were thinking about online courses like, well, if you're in a face-to-face -face course, you get up and you talk, and students write and they take notes, and at the end, they're going to fill out a Blue Book exam. And uh, I remember my first uh, time adjuncting here, coming up on eight years ago now, I asked the uh, administrative assistant uh, in the College Technology, who will remain nameless, but is still here in a different role, I said, got to the end of the semester, and I said, I need a pack of Blue Books. He said, what's a Blue Book? Um, so that's when I realized that college in the 2000s was not the same as college it was in the 90s. So another entry point, here's a picture of Dr. Sally Reisman doing video discussion boards. We just talked about how discussion boards become a, a tenant of online learning, because that's an easy way to go. Like, I write questions and the students have to answer and they have a discussion. Well, because we've made use of Kaltura's integration into Blackboard, people can do video discussion boards just as easily, if not easier, than writing. Uh, and students are usually very happy to be like, wait, I can just talk, I don't have to write. So as an instructor, you can ask questions on video and you can ask the students to respond on video. This particular example is that first week introductory discussion board where Sally's asked her students in her uh, culinary class to say, I want you to get in that discussion board and you make a video introducing yourself and then she responds to them in video. So you can have a, a discussion uh, that's almost like face to face, but instead it's asynchronous uh, and it still gives students the flexibility they're used to from online learning, but they get to see and hear you, they get to see and hear each other. And that's very basic. And if you want to do discussion boards on steroids, that's when you do VoiceThread. VoiceThread lets you create multimedia threaded interactive experiences with PowerPoints and video and audio recording and annotations. Uh, and if none of you have yet worked with uh, Christina Azroff, she's our uh, multimedia technologist whose specialty is Collaborate Ultra and VoiceThread. And she has a plethora of training materials available of how you can use VoiceThread, also integrated right into Blackboard. So if you like the idea of discussion boards, Check it out and introduce your students to the idea of uh, voice thread discussions and you can create this whole threaded asynchronous multimedia experience and uh, we get great feedback from students when an instructor tries voice thread as opposed to a traditional discussion board, they really go nuts over it. So it's an amazing tool to again help bring life and make your courses more dynamic. So how do you take it again beyond that? Um, these are some examples where instructors are creating video instructional segments. These are some uh, highlight examples of instructors who we've worked with uh, to say, I've got these things I used to do in a face-to-face -face class. How do I do that now in the online class? So this example is from Irish American Heritage and Culture. <coughs> and this is an instructor who taught many, many years, taught this course as an adjunct face-to-face. -face. And his program chair said, I want you to put it online. It's a course that would lend itself well to being an online course. And he said, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do for an online course. And he went all the way to the director of online learning, to Matt Davis, and said, I don't know, what, I don't know how to do this online. Because when I teach face to face, I bring in an Irish fiddle player. I bring in Irish dancers. I, I don't know what I can do. I can't make this work online. So Matt connected the instructor with us and said, could we make videos? Could we have the fiddle player come in the studio and give his whole background of, and, and play a bunch of his Irish songs? And we said, sure, we can do that. And I said, what about the Irish dancing? So we went out to the Irish Culture Club and recorded them having uh, 
one of their Irish dancing celebrations, and uh, Alex, who is one of our, our camera operators, is working here right now, went out there and shot a bunch of video of the Irish dancing, and we turned that into a package that goes in Blackboard. And Drew, who's another of our media technologists, worked with Alex, uh, different Alex, the fiddle player, um, to come into the studio, play his fiddle, talk about what he did. He had a little PowerPoint presentation, he played a bunch of Irish songs, and now these video segments live in the online course. And this is an instructor who isn't someone who was particularly tech savvy. He didn't have to know how this stuff got done, he just had to know that there was people there that could help him do it. So now we have this course, which really, the instructor just couldn't wrap his mind around how this could be done online, and we have a way to have this amazing dynamic experience inside uh, an online course, and the response to having these pieces in the course is even beyond what was available uh, in his face-to-face -face courses. So another example, and this is uh, Don Stuhlman from the College of Business, uh, FIN305 financial management. So Don is one of the people that has really taken advantage of our project for do-it-yourself lecture capture. Uh, and this is another instructor who had taught face-to-face -face for a long time, said, I need, I need the students to see me and hear me. I need to be talking to them. I can't just give them articles to read. That's not the way I can teach. So he has worked uh, with, with our group and uh, used our do-it-yourself lecture capture project, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, uh, to go into a classroom, set up his own do-it-yourself lecture capture and record video segments that go into his courses. And if you look uh, at the screenshot from Blackboard, you can see he's got a number of little screencasts in there made in Capture Space with Kaltura. Uh, he's also got videos that we help him produce but using his do-it-yourself lecture capture. Uh, and his course is filled now with videos about capital investments and interest rates and, and how stocks are priced. Um, things that bring this real earnest, authentic face-to-face -face experience into the online course. And this is something that the instructor is doing on his own. This is a do-it-yourself project that, that we help you with. So this is really the pinnacle of where video changes everything in terms of education. Um, it's not just about the faculty member creating the video experience, but of course we, that's one of the things we really want. But what about the student being part of the video experience? So this is from Holistic Health, uh, which is one of the online nursing courses. Now if you go back five years ago, um, the way they did the assessment for this course, uh, presumably if it was completely online, they used uh, text, they used uh, some type of essay questions or maybe multiple choice, and they, they had to do some kind of, of written assignment to try to reproduce what the assessment process was. Well now, because students have 100% full use of Kaltura the same way instructors do inside Blackboard, um, they create their week seven final project and they give them a bunch of different physical assessments they should have learned throughout the course of the year. And based on where your last name falls, you have to make a video of yourself performing this assessment. So this screen capture is two students in the nursing program, and they actually switched off. So I did a screen cap, but the, the, the guy sitting down and the woman standing up are both nursing students, and they both did their final project this way. They made the video in Kaltura and submitted that into Blackboard. So now, even though they are online students, the nursing instructor gets to see them perform this assessment. So what's a better way to really evaluate whether someone is a competent nurse or not performing a medical procedure? Having them write about it or having to see them do it? Uh, and these students did give me permission to use this, this capture from them. And uh, the second video right after it, they're just reversed. He puts on the white coat and she sits down and he does whatever fell in his last name, whether it was head and neck, eye and ear, et cetera. Um, so this is a really amazing way to take advantage of students creating instructional content for assessment. Really high level stuff, but it's something we can help you with. And the way the instructor has structured the assignment, if you are able to see it, the capture from Blackboard up there, uh, it gives you instructions of what to do, and then there's also a training video of if you don't know how to use Kaltura, watch the video, it'll show you how to use it. Read the PDF, it'll show you how to use it. And all those training materials are available for you to drop into your Blackboard courses. So students have no excuse whatsoever not to be able to, to do this stuff. So we talked about why. Why video and multimedia? Why is it important? Well, why lecture capture? Um, Lecture capture technology increases student attendance and academic performance. So how many of you have ever heard or thought yourself maybe that, well, if I put lectures into Blackboard, they won't come to class anymore? I've heard it from people. Um, instructors say, well, no, if I make it, why would they come to class if everything's uh, available online? So luckily, EAB, again, credible sources, more credible than I am, have gone out there and said, no, you put the lecture cap te technology in the online course, Students are going to come to class more because they're going to know who you are. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to want to come and be in a room with you because 
they've got that content available to watch and they're going to feel more of a connection with you. So it may seem a little counterintuitive, but again, credible sources say it actually will improve attendance. It's not going to make your students skip class. Um, but of course, the most important thing uh, is ease of use and cost when you come to lecture capture. There are some big research schools that'll go out and apply for grants and they'll get millions of dollars to wire all their classrooms for lecture capture and that's a wonderful thing. It's not the case here. But there are budget friendly options to create lecture capture segments, make them available in your course. And in fact, some of the techniques that we've developed and we work out with faculty tend to work a little better because when you do have rooms that are completely wired for lecture capture, you run the risk of saying, well, I have five hour class, record, stop five hours later and put it all in Blackboard. And I hate to say it, nobody's gonna watch it. Um, so the techniques we develop and we share with faculty is to say, break it up into segments. You want short chunks. Think about topics and segmenting out your lecture. Because when you go into class, we'll, we'll, we can pretend that we all stay for five hours. But the first half hour, everybody's dribbling in, they're eating dinner, they're talking, taking attendance, they're telling you why they didn't have their assignments ready. By the time you're actually ready to start teaching something, you're a half hour, 45 minutes into class. So you're gonna talk for 20 minutes maybe, and then you're gonna take a break and everybody's gonna go, to, you're gonna say, let's take a five minute break and then 20 minutes later, everybody will be back in class. We don't need, why record all that in your lecture capture? Record the 20 minutes where you're actually teaching and put that in Blackboard. So there is some advantages to not having the ability just to record every single thing that's going on. So when it comes to lecture capture on a budget, this is how we're leveraging some technology, exactly what you saw Don Stuhlman doing. Uh, we have robotic camera turrets called swivels. Uh, we lend it out to the instructor. They record their segments by topic. Uh, they wear a little remote control around their neck. It has a microphone, so the audio sounds great. The video is full HD. The camera turret follows them around the room, so they don't have to stay in one place. Uh, and they can just start and stop the recording right from the marker that hangs around their neck. So they can just record when they're actually teaching something. And we encourage them to do short segments by topic, 10, 15, 20 minutes is ideal. And you drop those into your course by topic. You can send them right to Kaltura, right from the setup and have a totally DIY experience right into Blackboard. We tend to help people with the uploading process when they, when they borrow the gear. But uh, it can be a completely instructor-led operation where you record the video and you can have it uploading and appearing in Blackboard right at the end of class uh, if you want to do that. So it takes about 15 minutes for you as an instructor to learn how to use this device. You borrow it from us, you take it into class, or you take it into an empty classroom. You don't have to do this in a live face-to-face -face class. You could do it just sitting in an empty room, in an empty conference room, a classroom, a lecture hall, even at home. We'll talk about some ways people have done this at home. But uh, if you want, when that file's done, you can send it, you can log into Blackboard on the iPad and Safari, upload it right to Kaltura. And it can be in your class as soon as the class is over, if you want to do it that way. And there's Don Stuhlman again. And this is a capture right from a swivel video. This is not low quality, uh, old VGA resolution stuff. You can see the marker hanging around his neck lets you start and stop the recording, has Bluetooth wireless audio that sounds crystal clear. You see the video looks perfect in full HD. This is something completely do it yourself on the instructor side. So what about beyond the classroom? And again, I wish I could take credit for this idea, but I mentioned uh, Dr. Sally Reisman, uh, who teaches an online culinary class. And you'd think that that would be difficult to pull off on its own, but she manages to do it. And she, of course, is well-versed in our swivel project and said, well, you know, people use it in class, but couldn't I take it home and use it in my kitchen? Or take it to a cooking expert in a particular style of cooking and use it in their kitchen? Uh, and like I said, I wish I could have taken credit for that, but so she took the swivel, took it to an Indian cooking expert's house, set it up in her kitchen, and let her demonstrate a recipe, and then we put those videos into Blackboard. So another advantage to having this very flexible lecture capture option is it doesn't have to be lecture capture. It can be capture of anything, and it's still totally DIY. And 100% truth, she made this video herself. We didn't go to this woman's house and shoot the video. Sally borrowed an iPad and a swivel, which all comes together, set it up, hung the marker around her neck, you can see it in the picture, uh, and, and went off and gave, brought it back to us and said, here you go, here's, the, here's her doing the recipe, doing a little interview, and it goes right into Blackboard. And you can see uh, this course has, I think, five or six different video recipes in it at this point for a completely online culinary class, and they even get uh, a package, they get a kit that they're mailed out and they have to cook a recipe based around this kit in their own home and they have to make videos and send those back to, to the instructor in the course. It's a really, really cool concept. 
So other new projects, video-enabled classrooms. And uh, of course, when I just told you, oh, lecture capture can be all flexible. Well, of course, there's some advantage to having things that are existing permanently in a classroom. So um, this is a project we worked on jointly with the IT department, and it's still in a pilot phase. We just finished the, uh, the first part of the pilot in the spring semester. So we had um, a request from the College of Arts and Sciences. They said, we have two math students that live way downstate. They can't get here for the face-to-face -face class. They need to graduate. Now, the, the graduation that's coming up on Sunday, this, we had this discussion in the winter time, just before the semester was gonna start. Um, we have to find a way to give them this class. They can't get here, they need it to graduate. So we got together with IT, of course none of this was budgeted, but uh, we got together with the IT and said, what, what can we do? How can we make this work for, for almost free? Um, so because we're using Blackboard Collaborate Ultra as our web conferencing, so you can sit at home, wear your headset, sit at your desk, wear your headset, thought maybe there's a way we can make this work in class and have a synchronous, face-to-face -face experience that remote students can join. Um, and they said, well, we've never done it before, and we're not sure it'll work, but we had to try something, because uh, we had just a couple of weeks to kind of get this all together. Uh, and we had three students join two different math courses. Uh, every single week, joined uh, down from Georgetown. They went to a study room in Georgetown on their own laptops, uh, two of the students, and then a third student would join in from home. Uh, and they joined in discrete math and calculus two with an adjunct, uh, who taught a face-to-face -face class uh, to about 10 students or so, you can kind of see them in the lower picture, and three students, so at least three students remotely, uh, all inside Blackboard Collaborate. And because this was a math course, we had the extra challenge of, well, we can't just have PowerPoints and can't just have him talk. He's got to be able to write formulas on the board and have people see that in class and at home. So by leveraging Collaborate's whiteboard capabilities, he's able to go and draw formulas on the board. And you can see a little bit about that uh, in the picture. And the students at home are able to hear the instructor, hear everybody in the room, have synchronous conversations. If the students remotely talk, their voices come through the speakers. And they went through an entire 15 week semester long, two math courses, discrete math and calculus two, using this new piloted format uh, in a way to uh, graduate, to, to pass these classes and graduate. Um, and uh, we've got more classes coming this summer, more math classes. Uh, there's a CPA certification course for the College of Business that's gonna take advantage of these two. One, two, we have video-enabled rooms right now, one here at Newcastle Upstairs, and one over at the Grad Center. We do hope that uh, we see that expand. We think there's a lot of interest in seeing that project expand, and we expect there will be more rooms uh, with this capability in the future. Of course, it requires an interactive whiteboard along with uh, the camera and audio technology, but uh, it was a response to student need. And that's really what we're talking about. The whole point of all this is, how is it changing everything about education? And this is one of the ways. We're responding to student need. We're uh, providing a service to our students that would not have been able to graduate if we didn't find a way for them to do this. So another of our new projects, again, serving the student community, serving the faculty community, is our Learning Commons Multimedia Studio. And this is something that uh, we partnered with the library on uh, based around the Penn State One Button Studio concept. Uh, we had been aware of this for, for several years now. Penn State has really taken this concept and run with it. They've deployed uh, over 10 of them just at uh, their main campus uh, in State College and multiples at almost every remote location they have. And um, we went out and saw it and they basically have this do-it-yourself space where students and faculty can come in and record videos. Because what we found, and we found this from the library, because we don't hear it on the multimedia side, because we talk to people who have the technology. What we heard from the library is students are being asked to make these Kaltura videos, which is great, that's what we want, or being asked to participate uh, in, in, a, in a video project. And they come in and say, I don't, have a, I don't have a laptop, or I don't have a webcam, I don't have a headset, um, or I don't have internet at my house. I mean, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect, but but there are students that, that just don't have those things. They don't have the tools they necessarily need to be successful. So we wanted to find some way to help mitigate that. Now, of course, to buy a webcam, to buy a headset, these are, are very inexpensive, but not everybody can afford to spare even another $10. If they're already a working adult with a family, they're going back to school on the side, they may not have that extra money available. They may need to spend that on something else. So we put together an even lower budget version of the Penn State One Button Studio concept, uh, built into one of the study rooms at the New Learning Commons. Uh, and we put in a camera, a microphone, a green wall, so you can do green screen, a couple of lights, and everything takes, it's more than one button. It takes a couple of buttons. You have to turn on, I think, two total buttons and push in one card. So it's still pretty easy. Uh, there's a book there with pictures that shows you how to do everything. All the student has to come in with on their own is an SD card, and everybody has one of those. They bring in an SD card, they put it into the camera, they turn on 
the power strip and one button on the camera and that's it. And they can sit down and record a video. Same thing for a faculty member. If you want to record a video and you don't have the time or the inclination to book time with us or, or maybe you can't go to our schedule, you can go into this room, you can book time directly with a library online. There's an online calendar that we worked out with them. Uh, and you can sit down and record any kind of instructional piece you want. If you want to just have a green background, then you're done. If you want to put some graphics behind you, you can do that in iMovie, in Windows Movie Maker in any number of free utilities, and we have some resources in with the instructions. If you want to do the green screening yourself, here's some ways you can do it. Um, these things don't have to be limited to, to specialists anymore, to people with high-end equipment. Uh, everything in this room is under $1,000 to make this do-it-yourself studio space available. It's small. I wouldn't go in there and, and expect to um, you know, shoot a football game, but if you just need to sit and have a conversation one instructor, maybe even two people, two people next to each other. If you wanted to interview someone for a course, you can do this. This is available right now. There's only one right now. It's over at the Learning Commons uh, at the Grad Center, but uh, I expect that there will be more of these made available at other campuses in the future as well. So that's a lot of things that we're doing here right now today at Wilmington University. Um, we're pretty well ahead of the curve with a lot of these things. We go to a lot of conferences, everybody in our group, and online learning and educational technology and the multimedia team. We go around and we see what other schools are doing and, and uh, both good and bad, we find that we're already ahead of what a lot of other schools are doing, even big research schools. We're providing these tools in Kaltura to every single user. Sometimes Kaltura is only available to faculty. Um, we're providing the ability for an instructor to make their own do-it-yourself lecture capture. The ability for every instructor to use web conferencing. Some places you have to request access to use web conferencing. We make it available to everybody. So we're actually pretty well, at least at the curve, if not a little bit ahead of it, as far as what we see our peers doing. Some things, though, you know, some things we're behind. But a lot of these things we're, we're ahead, or at least we're, we're, we're at the head of the pack, if not leading it. Um, but what else is going on right now? What is going on that, that we should be thinking about or we should be aware of? Because it's happening right now. Facebook Live. Everybody has access to live streaming right now. If you've looked at our multimedia project request form, we have specified that live streaming is generally only available for, for large events. We've been able to become more flexible with that. Like right now, we're live streaming today and Collaborate. So we didn't have to use our traditional live streaming through Kaltura. We're using Collaborate to create a live experience. But anybody go upstairs to Olay Live? Olay Live was done on Facebook Live did not require anybody from the EdTech or multimedia group. The online designers did that all on their own. Actually, I take that back. Adam helped them. He helped hold the iPad. But it did not require anybody with any special skills. You did not have to book a special technologist to help you do live streaming anymore. Anyone can do it right now. Why do people want to be live? Three times longer viewing than on-demand video. That means if a video is live, three times as many people are watching it. Uh, and videos have 135% greater organic reach. That means if you want to reach your audience, video is going to do it better than a photo, and a photo is going to do it better than text. That's why all of these things are important. Facebook generates 8 billion video views on average per day. That's a lot of video just on Facebook. Not YouTube, not Vimeo, not anything else, just Facebook. 8 billion video views a day. We know that people like Netflix, like Amazon, like HBO are producing their own content. They're not just distributors anymore. They're content creators. Uh, and they're killing it. Amazon original programming, Netflix original programming, HBO, Game of Thrones. Um, successful shows are being produced by distributors. Is Facebook next? Almost certainly. I guarantee you, you are going to see Facebook original programming within the next year. It is 100% certainty. So nice stats. Why is that all important to us? Facebook live in the classroom. So again, live streaming is traditionally this thing, oh, I need special stuff, special equipment, special people to help me with live streaming. You don't need it anymore. If you've got a phone, an Android, an iPad, you can be live in your classroom right now without any help from us. Um, we certainly encourage you to use our facilities, but uh, in K-12, they don't have a multimedia team. They don't have an educational technology team. If you're lucky in a K-12 school, you've got one person in IT who's maybe available to help people out. But this is still something that could come in handy in higher education. Puts that ed tech in the hands of the users, not just specialists. So in this example here, um, we have 10 and 11 year olds who are watching a heart dissection uh, in Bangkok, uh, live using Facebook Live. No special equipment is needed. Uh, no special people are needed to help with it. The instructor was able to take the iPad, mount it using some very inexpensive sort of clamp, 
uh, and those are available at five below or anywhere, just something to hold an iPad up over a table, and he's performing a heart dissection for 10 and 11 year olds. So if they're in class, they can watch on their device if they're a little squeamish, and if uh, the article that was associated with it said even the people in the room, maybe they didn't want to see it live, but they were okay if they watched it on, their, on the computer just to have a little bit of distance between someone cutting up a heart. Again, 10 and 11 year olds. But also, of course, in Bangkok, they had all these remote students who couldn't get to school. They have different, different uh, you know, needs than we do. So they were able to use Facebook, watch this video, and then it's recorded and archived and available instantly. This is why these stats about Facebook video are so important. For, we need to be aware of this. We need to know what else is going on um, and make sure that we're, we're at least keeping our hand in it and knowing what things instructors and students are going to take advantage of. What else is new? Netflix has 86 million users in 190 countries. YouTube users are watching a billion hours of video content every day. And I know a lot of our instructors are using YouTube uh, in courses, and that's fine. I mean, certainly they have a little bit more video than we have, even though we have a lot. Um, a billion hours of content every single day, that's just unfathomable. Uh, Amazon's invest investing three billion a year in developing video content. A lot of you are familiar with Amazon's original programming. You're certainly familiar with Netflix's original programming. Subscription on demand is embracing educational programming now. These distributors are becoming content creators and they're becoming educational content creators. That could lead to unbundling of services, the same way it has led to unbundling of cable services and unbundling of you having to have this delivery to your house, it could lead to unbundling of educational services too. And that's why we need to be aware of it and we need to make sure that we're involved in it. Uh, Sesame Street was on public television for 46 years. Last year, HBO bought the license uh, because Sesame Street was going out of business and that's a very long story as to why that was the case, but HBO. Uh, Game of Thrones HBO, Sopranos HBO, Oz HBO. Not somebody you generally associate with children's programming, unless you go all the way back to Fraggle Rock. They bought the license for Sesame Street, and now Sesame Street airs on HBO, a pay television service. That is just something that would have been unthinkable. It does still eventually air on PBS, but HBO has a moratorium that it has to funnel through their subscription service. So they're getting interested in educational programming. Uh, Amazon and Netflix are already doing educational programming. Uh, they're producing it cheap. They're making, they're making it available cheap because they're taking advantage of their own distribution mechanism to get it out to you. So what's next? Why is that all important and what it leads to what's next? 82% uh, of all internet traffic predicted to be video by 2020. Um, of course, these are predictions, but if you think about where video is right now, that's probably pretty conservative, that most internet traffic is going to be video. 360 video, uh, a million 360 videos were already uploaded to Facebook, a million of them, and that's brand new technology. And we've already had people asking us here at Wilmu, can we do 360 video? We can, by the way, Kaltura does support 360 video and it is something that we'll be, we'll be debuting eventually. Tim Day, in fact, was the person who said, can we do 360 video? And yes, we can. Uh, and he was very excited to hear that because of course our College of Technology students, they are staying on top of cutting edge video technology as well. They're got, buying drones, they're buying 360 cameras. Uh, Tim is going to be teaching a class, I think, in drone video, right? Yeah, okay, in the fall, drone video. Um, so to serve our students, to stay competitive in college technology uh, and as a whole, we need to stay on top of this technology. So fortunately, the platforms that we're using are going to be able to take advantage of this. What about virtual reality and augmented reality? So like I said, we go to a lot of conferences. Um, we see that already in STEM programs right now, they're using augmented reality and virtual reality for education. We saw at Drexel at the e-learning conference uh, just a couple of months ago, we saw architecture and engineering students designing buildings virtually to see if they would fall down or not. Uh, being able to walk through them when you design a building, see where the staircases go because you can virtually walk through your design. We saw medical students performing medical procedures in the virtual reality environment. Um, and we saw augmented reality being used for uh, chemistry and biology experiments. Um, chemistry labs maybe aren't available to everybody. Maybe the the components that are needed are too expensive. So you could perform dangerous experiments in virtual and augmented reality that you wouldn't necessarily have the resources to do in person. So we're, we're already seeing it at top level STEM programs and we're going to see that filter down to um, the kind of programs we do. We're going to see augmented reality and virtual reality be important in health professions. We're gonna see it be important in college of education. We're gonna see it be important in college of arts and sciences, college of business. I mean, it's going to be necessary everywhere. We're already getting companies contacting us and saying, 
do you want to get involved? Do you want to have virtual reality uh, edu in, in your educational environment? The only difference right now is the content library is not there. That's why it's what's next. Because the technology's there, the content library is in, is, isn't yet. They want us to help build the content library. Uh, they want us to create these virtual reality lessons. And we're not quite there yet. We're not ready to embrace it, but there are people who are. Um, On-demand content and set-top devices. That's when you get your Roku, your Chromecast. 202 million people in the US are watching digital video on connected TVs. If you go and buy a TV right now, it comes with Netflix, it comes with Amazon Prime. Uh, and if it doesn't, then you plug in your Roku, you plug in your Chromecast. I checked the stat yesterday, so I would know it off the top of my head. There's 320 million people in the US as of 2015. So 202 of them are going to be watching TV over these set-top connected devices. So that's a big shift away from cable. And because of these kind of set-top devices, it gives them pivot points. Cable is very locked down. Cable is very traditional. But when you have the ability to pivot, that's when places like Netflix, like Amazon Prime, like HBO Now can become content creators along with their distribution mechanism. Uh, we're already seeing educational institutions taking advantage of set-top delivery for live events, for sports, and for instructional content. Um, it's very early stages, but there's already higher ed institutions that want to deliver content this way. Um, and that is certainly going to be something that we need to be aware of and we need to keep our hand in. So that's a lot to wrap your mind around. That's an awful lot to think about, an awful lot, and it's kind of dizzying because even the things we do now, we're not reaching every faculty member and it can be a little daunting. Uh, and to think about, wait, now I've got to also be prepared for 360 video and drone video and virtual reality and augmented reality and thinking about all these different ways I might deliver my content. I, I, don't, I just got a webcam. Um, where do you get help? How do you solve these technical difficulties? Well, that's where we're here for you. That's where educational technology and multimedia is here to try to help connect you and make things easier and try to uh, pull you back from the edge. So the first thing you should do is call the help desk. If you're having difficulty with anything, collaborate, Kaltura, your webcam, email, anything at all, start with the help desk. Our help desk is there to help you and their hours are much better than ours. Um, besides that, they can remote into your computer and help you immediately. So 99% of your problems are gonna be able to be solved by the help desk. Um, Joe Ward and Brian Beard's team on the help desk are amazing and they will be able to solve almost everything that's wrong. Uh, if you are uh, more inclined to learn yourself, Right inside Blackboard, we have help materials and training materials for everything you could possibly want to know about Kaltura, Collaborate, Blackboard, VoiceThread. Click on any of those tabs at the top of Blackboard, and that's where you can find training documents, training videos, helpful tips and tricks, whatever means you like to uh, intake knowledge. Some people like to read about it in a PDF with pictures. Some people like to watch a video. So we have all of those available. Uh, and of course, if all else fails, you're also welcome to, to work with us directly for training, for one-on-one -on -one training, for webinars. I mean, that's what we're here for. We're not just here to provide the technology. We want you to, to embrace the technology. We want to help you use it, and we want to help you make your classroom experience better. On the web, we have all of our training videos for educational technology, not just multimedia, all the ed tech training videos. Go on to Wilm YouTube, which is our public-facing portal. Whether you want to learn about Prezi, or Blackboard, or Kaltura, or Collaborate, or VoiceThread, or anything else. It's all available there in our training video section. We also have an awful lot of it available on the website. Um, our multimedia area is wilmu.edu slash multimedia, but there's also wilmu.edu slash edtech, where you can find workshop calendars and training information to get in touch with almost anything that passes through edtech or online learning. Primarily Blackboard, but there's a lot of other tools as well. Look at our workshop calendar. Come in for a workshop. If you can't do that, join in a webinar. If you can't do that, just call us or email us, and we'll do our best we can to train you. But again, tech support, check with the help desk first. But if you want training and help, we're, we're the people you want to talk to. So you can find out more uh, about us in the multimedia group at womu.edu slash multimedia. Uh, you can also email us directly, uh, multimedia at womu.edu. Um, I hope this gave you a little picture of what it is that we do and gives you an idea of some of the tools that are available to you as instructors. And, Thank you very much for having me. I wanted to open it up the floor to any questions that might be available. Is yeah. there a way to, when you make a Kaltura video now, to email that video out to your students? Yes, with an asterisk. Uh, yes, but you have to email us to get the link, and we'll provide the link to you. So 
we can't make content in Blackboard available directly for the end user to share because of FERPA. Um, we need to make sure that that request is passing through either the content owner or the instructor. So we can't just make everything available in Blackboard able to be shared everywhere, but we are happy to provide you an external link as the instructor or even on the student side if they're the content owner. Drop an email to multimediaonly.edu, we'll give you a link to the video. I think there was another question over there, Christian. Do we have any constraints if we want to, is there a way to capture what our students are actually doing in our live classroom and be able to capture that on video and share it in, inside the Blackboard so that they can refer back to it throughout the remainder of the course? Um, like if the students were having like a group discussion? Um, or if they like were performing a skit and I want them I to be able to okay. refer back to okay. tell so, me what went wrong? Um, short answer, no. Long answer, yes. Uh, if you borrow the swivel from us, you could borrow that on a certain class date and you could hang that marker right around the student's neck and you could make videos of the students and you could then put those videos uh, into Blackboard via Kaltura. Um, there are, isn't really a way just to automatically capture something the students are doing, but we are certainly available. Uh, we, the swivel technology would be perfect for that. And are, are there any, because of FERPA, are yes. there any legal constraints with using those students' videos? Um, Again, I'm going to say yes with a but, the but being you are clearly videotaping them. So I think just by telling them, hey, I'm going to put these in Blackboard, is that OK? Um, I think that'll cover you. It's not a hidden camera. They're going to be clearly like, hang, you know, hang this around your neck so we can record you on this robot that's following you around. So it's not hidden. Um, I think just by saying, is this, you know, we're going to put this in Blackboard. Are you comfortable with that? As long as you get their permission to share it in Blackboard, I think that would be fine. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not your lawyer. That does not constitute legal advice. <laughs> oh, there's a, wait for the microphone, and okay, there's one over here, yes. So my question is in regards to the um, lecture capture. Could you elaborate a little bit more in regards to how you would actually capture the lecture? Are you doing that prior to class, or are you doing that during the class? Your choice. If you are uh, especially, uh, you know, vigorous, you could absolutely do that in a live face-to-face -face class. We have had instructors do that, where they take the swivel, they set it up on the front desk during a live class, and capture it as the class is going on. Uh, most of the instructors who are using it are doing it in an empty classroom uh, before class, because they want sort of that comfort level of, I don't have anybody watching me right now. But, um, like if it was me, I would error on the side of laziness, and I'd rather just bang it out in one go, and I would do it live in class, and we have had instructors do it that way, so uh, the, the, the too long didn't read is either way, your choice. Over there, Christian. Just a quick question. What of your wonderful training materials are available to us who aren't part of Wilmington University, and what's, you know, not in Blackboard? Everything that is on wilmu.edu slash wilmutube is publicly available. So all of our training videos are available both publicly and in Blackboard. The only exceptions are things that are proprietary Wilmu systems like how to log into your email account, how to use our SharePoint site. Those things are restricted to Wilmu employees. But Kaltura, Collaborate, Prezi, Blackboard, Grade Center, uh, rubric tool, anything we've got a video on is also available publicly. And in fact, there was a time, I don't know if it's the case anymore, but if you Googled Kaltura training videos, our videos came up higher in a Google search than Kaltura's did. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> I don't think it's the case anymore. Now they have Kaltura University, which is a very, very good training resource. Oh, there's a question here, if you wait for till a microphone gets to you, Joe. Hey a um, uh, short video vignettes at home, say in the area of um, finance. And I want to use um, material from my PowerPoints, material that might uh, link into, say, a one minute video at uh, Khan Academy. And most importantly, I want to be able to write on a, um, a digital tablet with a pen, mm -hmm. uh, formulas and examples and show the students, but I'm doing this from home in my mm -hmm. library, and I wanna capture all of this on the screen. What hardware and software combination 
can do that? Without testing it out myself with your tablet, I am going to say that capture space, if you do presentation capture, if your tablet interacts with the computer in the same way as a mouse does, then you should be able to draw on the screen using the drawing tools because it would read a mouse with those drawing tools. So I think a tablet, drawing tablet would also work that way. Um, and I can say definitely that uh, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, if you use, again, if your tablet interacts with it in the same way as a mouse would, you'd use the, the whiteboard inside Collaborate Ultra, and you should be able to draw on that with your tablet. But I would think that that would also work fine in capture space if you did either screen recording or presentation recording. If you use the drawing tools, which come up, there's a little button you can press to pull up the drawing tools. If your tablet pen reacts with the computer in the same way as a mouse, you should be able to do that with capture space. Uh, oh, okay, starting from Android. Uh, no, I missed that part. I, I, I thought you were talking about a tablet that you might plug into your, um, your computer. With Android, um, we don't have a, a mobile interface yet for Capture Space, but that is coming maybe, Ken? Do I remember that there was a mobile interface coming for Capture Space? Uh, iPad first. iPad first, okay. Right. Okay, so there will eventually be a way to do Capture Space right from the tablet, uh, but I can say, uh, for sure that this summer Blackboard is debuting Blackboard Instructor. So everybody probably knows that BB Student is the mobile app right now for Blackboard for students and that's also how they would access Collaborate Ultra via mobile. This summer uh, BB Instructor is coming out which will enable you to moderate a Collaborate session from an Android or iOS device and that should allow for drawing on the screen if it's an Android or iOS tablet. Joe, you always have the tough questions. Anybody else? Anyone online ask anything, Christina? Okay. Well, then I thank you very much for having me. I hope you found it informative.